When the founding president Jomo Kenyatta died at an advanced age, a shaken and mournful nation could not ask questions. But his press officer who watched him through his last earthly assignment was quietly and bitterly pointing an accusing finger. Mahiku was there. Mbiyoko Inage was there. Mahiku was his trusted provincial commissioner. Mbiyoko Inange was not only the minister of state in the office of the president, he was also Kenyatta's brother-in-law. Why did they take Kenyatta to State House Mombasa? And Pandia Memorial Hospital is there. Kenyatta was commander-in-chief of the armed forces. Denda Nigechoro, Kanodenda Nigechoro, the then commander of the Kenya Air Force, should have been told to bring a caribou and the very Kenyatta to Nairobi Hospital. But then first aid should have received, should have received the first aid Pandia Memorial Hospital or wherever. Kenyatta's last day was spent here at the Msambweni Primary School and Lin Jiro recalls a day that had all the hallmarks of things going astray. Even before he collapsed, they should have seen Kenyatta's behavior in the state house at the large time. When he hosted uh, Kenya's foreign envoys, they had been, been recorded for briefing. Yeah. He, Kenyatta was in a state of luster. Yeah. Even going to Musambweni, he was not himself. He even did something which he has never done before. He forgot his uh, trademark, fly whisk. We had to send a car back to collect it. And we had to, we had to stop with the ferry. He calls it a matter of fate. Lee Njiru was only a junior information officer in Kakamega, the headquarters of what used to be the Western Province, when he was ordered to report to the State House Nakuru. One of President Kenyatta's press officers had taken leave, and the State House required a temporary replacement. That temporary replacement was to last in the State House for 25 years. When I went to State House in Akuru, I was talking to Muse, I was taken to Muse Kenyatta. He was in a small room. He was with the late Minister of State, Peter Mbioko Inange. So when I was being introduced to Kenyatta, I trembled. Because I had so I had heard so many stories about Kenyatta that his eyes were on their forehead, he had a hairy tongue. So with that kind of um, mysterious characterization of Kenyatta, so you had to tremble. So Kenyatta said, Bio Nikarai Naina, meaning Bio is trembling. But the Bio assisted me. He said, it is the right of every citizen to tremble in the in front of his president. You know. You know, he had um, those eyes whereby you feel sometimes loved, sometimes intimidated. You do not know where, where, where it is. I think the power. During the struggle for independence, I used to hear people say, Kenyatta wa muiga ine we kingi wandoiro. Simply means that uh, uh, Jomo Kenyatta was the king of the African people. I think. The praise of that song got into Kenyatta's head. I think he actually did come to believe that he was an African king and it was his entitlement. You know, his eyes were, were rough. <laughs> Jomo Kenyatta easily stood out among leaders agitating for Kenya's independence. He was much older than most of his freedom struggle peers but also had the air of the leader of choice in the group, complete with a commanding presence and voice. My leadership has not been to darkness and, 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 and death, but to light and prosperity. 
He was, as a result, the unanimous pick of all the leaders, including Janamogi Oginga Odinga, who turned down an offer by the colonial authorities that would have made him the first prime minister of a self-governing Kenya. Oginga Odinga instead made a tough demand. There will be no independence without Jomo Kenyatta. Jaramogi insisted uh, when the British governor wanted to hand him over power uh, before independence that no, for two reasons. One, he said, uh, and this is quite uh, a lure looking at things, that the Kikuyu had uh, shed blood for the liberation of the country more than any other group, ethnically speaking. Uh, and therefore, it would have been wrong in Jaramogi's assessment for someone else coming from a different community which had not shed as much blood, quantitatively speaking, to then assume power. Th that to him, that was unfair. And then there was Jomo Kenyatta, who was older, who was more worldly, who was more experienced, and who, like Mandela in South Africa, the mentioning of his name would rally the country together, that that was a good thing. So he said, no, give Jomo a chance first. Without Jomo, there is no independence. At an age estimated at over 70, Jomo Kenyatta became the country's first prime minister and a year later, first president. Harambe, Swahili for pulling together, became his rallying call for the new nation, whose myriad challenges included healing the rifts arising from the bitter struggle for freedom, particularly in Kenyatta's native central Kenya region. Kenyatta wasted no time in exerting his authority and showcasing his style. He was managing people that uh, he was able to manage. And the one important thing he did is to make the Kikuyus who disagreed in total because some of them were uh, corroborated with the British during the war. And the way we were saying, when Kenyatta comes back, we shall eliminate those who corroborated with the imperialist. But when he came, came back here to the surprise of everyone, he said, uh, we are all the same. We all fought for independence, even those collaborators. And therefore, we have to work together for the good of this nation. Kenyatta is a very interesting person. One of all, he is, uh, he is conscious of, uh, uh, of uh, dissent. He, he, didn't, he didn't like uh, uh, controversial views against his administration. And uh, put it this way, uh, he was conscious that uh, probably if you said something against his administration or against Kenyatta himself, he takes offense. The people surrounded, surrounding him, and especially the, the security people, most of them were illiterate. And they were up a bit. They were mesmerized by power. My first assignment as a district officer was in Mombasa. And the founder of the nation was fond of, uh, you know, working from Mombasa, the state house in Mombasa. And, and these very, um, very serious um, uh, or liking, he was fond of our traditional dancers. So after dinner every evening, there was um, traditional dancers' performance uh, from various groups in the coast. And we in the administration, we are supposed to be organizing these people every evening. And that was very, very interesting. The newly independent nation was, however, to fall into the trap of the so-called ideological war of the 60s between the West and the East, capitalism and communism, the United States of America and the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, USSR, or Soviet Union. The intrigues of the complex Cold War struck the heart of the Kenyan government separating Mze Jomo Kenyatta and his close friend and vice president, Oginga Odinga. Naturally, Jaramogi thought, I would succeed Kenyatta. So when he was saying, um, uh, he said Kenyatta was a second god, in fact, 
and he said there could be no independence without Kenyatta. I mean, Jeremogi was a Kenyatta psychophant. The Americans and the, 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 the Chinese, uh, Russians, were at that time involved very deeply in the Cold War. They, they, they at immediately after independence, the ambassadors started influencing Kenyan leadership, new Kenyan leadership. Initially, the struggle was between those who supported capitalism and those who supported socialism. But one side had the freedom to express itself. The other side didn't have the freedom to express itself. My understanding uh, of both, uh, none of them were saying the truth. Uh, Kenyatta was not an African socialist, he was a pure capitalist. Uh, 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 Odinga, on the other hand, I don't see him as a communist, he was just another capitalist. The problem, Haigukua kwa mze, na Haigukua kwa Jaramongi. This was an instigated problem from outside. He was a vice president for a very short time. And within that short time, when he realized that his policies were not being implemented, he could not agree with Kenyatta. I think it's because of the policies. He had different policies from what Kenyatta had. That was the biggest problem. And he would show, he would tell the public what he feels should be done. My personal view about that is that uh, Odinga was not flexible. They did not have any problem with Jaramogi. You remember, he even uh, would he travel to Nyanza, spend the nights at Jaramogi's place. At that time, we didn't have even a state lodge in Kisubu. He was wearing that thing, uh, the cap. But a stage reached where I think uh, the, the, these uh, Cold War tactics started uh, uh, indicating, uh, penetrating with uh, messages which were probably not genuine, which would uh, make each faction so and so an attacker kukutoa uh, and uh, they started suspecting one another, not knowing where the problem, uh, the genesis of the problem was. Jaramogi was, um, was an open-minded person. He was a great believer in his, in his type of politics, in his ideology. He believed that uh, given a fair chance, he could win as easily as anybody else. He was a believer in democracy. He probably did not realize uh, the extent to which the other side would go in destroying him and that uh, the other side was not democratic at all. The fighting was over power, um, even though nobody wants to talk about it. I, I think even if they had not discussed the issue of succession, I think it was quite obvious to Jaramogi and the rest that were around Kenyatta that Kenyatta was quite elderly by the time he took over power. Naturally, most people would have expected that he would relinquish the reins of power uh, before he died. The moment you have a deputy who is, who is always aggressive, you'll definitely accuse him for that. Because if you have somebody who has got his own opinion, who makes his own opinion and sticks to it, there's no way you can work. And I think that's what Jaramogi was. The perceived Kenyatta Odinga rivalry culminated in a series of tragic events that began with the assassination of Pio Gama Pinto, a freedom fighter of Goan descent. It is sad when you think that the first victim of assassination was a Goan fellow called uh, Gama Pindo, who I worked, I worked very closely with Gama Pindo in the early days. 
I was the editor of the Citizen newspaper, and at the same time we edited the Tribune newspaper. These are papers agitating for independence of Kenya. And I know Gama very well, Pinto. I've worked with him very closely. He should have not been the one who will, who will be assassinated on the, in the evening, in the, after independence. It is a very ugly situation. Pio Gama Pinto was killed because he was said to be the brain behind the socialist movement in Kenya. He was the advisor of Jaramogi Oginga Odinga. Oginga Odinga's position was clear. He had made it clear. He was a socialist. A year after Pio Gamapinto's death came the political liquidation of Jaramogi Oginga Odinga, who was then the vice president of both the country and the ruling party, Kanu. The mastermind of the liquidation process was Tom Boyer, the youthful political genius that was Kenyatta's sidekick. He was eloquent, he was smart, he knew what he was doing. I remember Tom Boya very well as a young man because um, we lived with him in Iziwani. And um, my father used to be the main milk distributor for the African estates. And I used to take milk to his house every morning. He was a very charming person, very good, very happy, but also aggressive, and uh, he was likable hmm, and forceful. He was a very, very good worker, and I'm sure Kenyatta would still have wanted a person like, uh, like Tom, who would be able to run around and do the work, not to, not to use anybody, but to work by himself. Tom Boyer, being Secretary General, was very close to Mze. And uh, the Americans would uh, try to get channels of getting messages to Mze about what the Russians and the Chinese were doing. Tomboy at the same time was, was uh, very intelligent and very focused. Because uh, he, I think he knew that uh, since Jomo Kenyatta was old, he was the most likely person to take over. And uh, he decided to be closer to Kenyatta. But Mboya himself could not last long after helping remove Oginga from the political center. A gunman fired several rounds at Mboya as he stepped out of a chemist along present-day Moy Avenue. Mboya died in an ambulance that was on its way to the Nairobi hospital. Tom Boya was not killed for the same reason that you would say Pio Gama Pinto. Pio Gama Pinto was killed because he was said to be the brain behind the socialist movement in Kenya. I do remember the Langas House Constitutional Conference because uh, I was for a regional system of government, Majimbo, although I was in Kanu. Tom Boyer was for a central system of government. And uh, I do remember telling Tom, Tom, a central system of government is dictatorship. You'll pay for it one day. Of course, he paid with his life. He said, when, when you think about it. Whatever ate Tom Boyer was his, was, was, was the struggle between him and uh, his uh, fellow capitalists when it came to the question of uh, succeeding Kenyatta. Because even then, Kenyatta looked very old. It's like nobody knew how long he had to go before he passed on. And the people were jostling for positions, each wanting to be in a position where they would be able to uh, inherit if Kenyatta died. Maybe those who were in power at that time felt that uh, Tom Boyer might be a challenge later on. And he could have been. With his organizational ability, he could, he could be a threat. So probably to the powers that be at that time, they thought, uh, they, they, they thought uh, that I think the time has gone, he has, he has to go. And finally he had to go. It was the killing of Tom Boyer that finally gave an ethnic tilt to the Kenyatta Oginga differences. A ceremony to open the present day New Nyanza General Hospital in Kisumu ended up being a platform of lure resentment against the Kenyatta administration. 
President Kenyatta traveled to Kisumu to open the hospital, but the ceremony coming only four months after the killing of Tom Boyer ended in bloodshed with the presidential guard and the police shooting many people dead when a commotion occurred within the presidential dais. Mze went there as a head of state and the head of government to open the hospital. And he went around because uh, we traveled from uh, Nakuru, Eldoret, down to Kakamega and then Kisumu. And he arrived there very jovial. Jeremogi was there waiting for him. Now, what is Alimiena? What is Alimiena? Lakini, for one reason or another, Kelele Yavijana. Ekaansa sasa booing Mzee Kenyatta. And Mzee is a Kenyatta as a security. And uh, you know, this, uh, the presidents have so many people as a uh, security. Sasa waka ingilia wale vijana. Na wale vijana wana wasuguma. Ugizuguma asikari na yei kuna bunduki. Wakaansa kupiga bunduki. Some people who did not want to dig to speak in that meeting, but uh, the, his people insisted that he must speak. So that's where the confrontation started. I was not the PC there, but I was in uniform. Uh, Morogol was the PC. Morogol, Wakati is the what we are security. That's when he answer to intervene to cool down these uh, people. The ministers who were accompanying the president went and uh, sat, uh, sat together with the muse, uh, together, and uh, the security surrounded the muse. PC, I got in the hospital, because the actual opening was outside. See, I got in the hospital, Jaramogi, I got in the hospital. Sasa, I got in the hospital. So I had now to jump in because I was in uniform to tell the Askaris because I knew them by name. Having been going to Katundu every week, I knew them by name. So I would say, where watch are you, Flani? Kamodo, watch are you? Flani, watch are you? It cooled down and we opened, they opened the hospital. Again, I would say, where watch are you? The events in Kisumu were the final nail on the coffin of the Kenyatta Oginga relations and the culmination of one of Kenya's longest running ethnic rivalries. The difference was not tribal. Now, when this happens, when um, Jaramogi is politically destroyed, um, and obviously by Kenyatta and his coterie, who happen to be Kikuyu, and then quickly afterwards, uh, uh, Jaramogi's rival in national politics, not just Lu politics, Tom Boy is assassinated. As a community, the Lu's immediately realize, ha, huh, so we are not dealing with friends. We are not dealing with compatriots. Uh, what then unites us? The Lu's do have a sense of, um, of being victimized by the previous regimes in, in this country. That's the Kenyatta regime, the Moi regime, and the Kibaki regime. So any time a community has got that uh, feeling of having been victims, then they rally around anyone who they feel is defender 
of the community. This so-called rivalry was artificially created by the elite around Kenyatta that thought that the only way to survive was to get rid of, the, uh, of a competitor who was not really a rival or even an enemy. Uh, and that then set in, in motion the so-called intractable historical rivalry between the Luo uh, and the Kikuyu. It has never been. The killing of Tom Boyer and the shootings in the Nyanza General Hospital came as part of a season of heightened intolerance that saw the Kenyatta administration cracking down hard on political opposition, banning political parties and detaining political leaders. The pattern was replicated in elections of 1969, where state agencies ensured Kanu domination. I was detained in 1967. Absolutely, there was no reasons at all. I was accused of plotting to overthrow the legally constituted government of the Republic of Kenya. I didn't have a gun, I didn't have a soldier, I didn't have a bullet. But there it is, I was sent behind bars in committee ne next almost to the gallows, just to frighten me. I was a security risk. <laughs> <laughs>